Great, we are on to our next event, a snapshot of sustainable tourism in India. I'm super excited to have you all here. And we'll actually simply pass it on to Shoiti, who will tell us a little bit about herself. And then the rest of the panel will also introduce themselves and dig right into this juicy topic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Marie. Um, I well, thank you so much, Altef, for inviting me. And uh, you know, it's a wonderful panel today. So I'm looking forward to having a great conversation. Um, I mean, I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Um, I, well, I've been a journalist for about 16 years, and uh, most of my work has been uh, about travel and food and uh, you know, um, culture and identity and gender. Um, so, you know, but last five years or five odd years, maybe about six years, I've, I've completely, uh, you know, focused on sustainable tourism as a subject and uh, not just as a journalist, but, but also as a facilitator. And, um, you know, I work as the project editor at Outlook Responsible Tourism Initiative. And uh, we've been trying to, you know, um, get people together across India and South Asia to have more of these conversations and to solve each other's problems. Um, so that's about it. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll you know, pass the mic now to uh, Mona to introduce herself and perhaps Kevi after that and Kushala, you could take turns and quickly introduce yourselves. Mona? Yes, I'm Mona Patrao and I'm from Panchkini. That's where Altef uh, is also operating from. Um, <clears throat> we're in the Western Ghats of Maharashtra in India. And um, I've I've just been on the land since I've been 18. Uh, so it's uh, in two years time, it'll be 50 years that we've been running an organic farm and doing a lot of things to be that are connected with, um, with the environment. And so ecotourism is something that has organically kind of grown in my sphere of things. And um, well, you know, as we go along in the presentation, things will unfold. Thank you. For having Thank you, Mona. Thanks a lot. Um, what about you, Kevi? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh uh, thank, thanks for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to jump on board this conversation. Um, so I'm uh, currently based in Melbourne and I've been working here for a while. So I worked for about seven or eight years in conservation, uh, mostly protecting cool temperate rainforest in uh, southwest Australia, oh, sorry, southeast Australia, including Tasmania and Victoria. Um, but also in addition to that, I have founded a responsible tourism agency uh, out of Nagaland. Um, and that's been running for uh, just over a year now. Um, and also, um, I have a, a connection with Panchgani. Uh, I have very fond uh, memories of Panchgani from uh, when I was young. Uh, I was there in Asia Plateau. Uh, so my father is an elder in an organization called IFC. Um, and so we spent some time there. Um, so he and my uncle would call it a second home. So it's an absolute pleasure to be part of a film festival uh, coming out of uh, Punch Gunny and also to meet you, Mona. Nice. Great. Thank you. And Kushala, uh, the artist, can you tell us about your work and yourself a little bit? Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Kushala and I'm an artist and I'm also uh, part of, um, been a pleasure working with the Altef team and I'm also based out of Punch Gunny. And I've grown up here um, and absolutely love it. I um, am, as an artist, I work with ceramics, I work with painting, I work with uh, video and photo. And um, a lot of my interest lies in the intersection of uh, looking at ecology and education and colonialism together. So this is a kind of like blend that I work with. Uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you all and, um, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. What a lovely, motley group of people we are. I mean, I'm just like, more we introduce ourselves, I'm, I'm getting even more excited. Thank you so much for joining us. What a wonderful, wonderful evening this is. And, um, you know, I before we dive into the, you know, the, the, the conversation about sustainable tourism, um, I thought that, you know, maybe I could quickly just uh, do a, an overview of what it means uh, to most of us, or as we understand it. And um, also, uh, you know, talk about perhaps a few good examples of, uh, you know, of, of 
films or visual communication that has uh, you know helped the sustainable tourism movement grow at least in india for the last few years um so you know eco tourism sustainable tourism responsible tourism transformational tourism now i believe it's called regenerative tourism so we've used all kinds of we've exhausted all kinds of labels over the last few years to essentially call any travel which is you know people friendly and planet friendly that's it right so um and i i think the one definition that i've always loved because of its simplicity is the one that i think was discussed in cape town back in 2002 where they simply said that we need to create better places for people to visit and better places for people to live in so and that they can't you know exist in isolation i think that's that's effectively the premise of responsible tourism as we understand it here in india and um to be honest 5 6 years ago when we 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 would talk about it uh, you know we just draw people would just draw blanks and you know and there was no no app, no warm welcomes nothing at all but i think that has shifted luckily for us um and um, so much so that uh, you know the ntp the national tourism policy which i had the privilege of i mean i, I gave my inputs as well we basically it's it's the it's the own, it's the primary aim for our government today um, i don't know what will happen but at least we are you know we are talking about these things now so that's that's i think that's a great thing especially now that the pandemic has uh, you know has well you know let's i'm looking at it as an opportunity has given us an opportunity in this uh, crazy you know adversity if if I mean, it's not really you know it's i don't know how it will pan out but i'm looking at it as an opportunity so sustainable tourism will grow for for us it will grow slowly but i think it will grow um as far as film making and i think a lot of us uh, i mean i'm a lot of you watching uh, i suspect have been wondering why we are talking about sustainable tourism on a film making platform and on a film festival you know during a film festival what is the link well um i mean the obvious you know the the obvious thing to me is that films are about dreams and uh, holidays are about dreams as well so they're also about experiences they're also about seeing the extraordinary in the ordinary and showing it to everybody storytelling so i think there's a lot that um, that uh, you know young filmmakers people who are who understand the visual medium better than those of us who are working on the ground and you know trying to do a, you know fair good tourism um, we could use your help and uh, some you know there are some traditional channels that are already i mean this has been happening for years i i noticed that you had a wildlife filmmaking uh, conversation earlier and you know so traditional filmmaker like a you know like a mike pandey and gotham they created this beautiful uh, movie called gyamo that i recently watched on the snow leopard in in ladakh and um, they highlighted the the impact of tourism there which which is huge and it's basically waste led i mean badly managed waste which is creating you know the problem of feral dogs which is hampering the numbers of uh, snow leopards and also affecting communities that are dependent on the snow leopard for their livelihood through tourism so those are the traditional channels and luckily for us i think i work with a few state governments as well and i can see that some of them are at least subtly trying to uh, you know trying to bring culture community and environment into their communication which is frankly a huge leap from where we used to be so those are the traditional channels but what i've been very excited about is um, something where i think kushala will also talk about later because all, through because of the all tef challenge in panchkani is um, how locals how uh, the community itself is now beginning to tell its own stories and we saw a fine example in in a place called munsiari a few years ago where uh, they crowdsourced smartphones and gave it to uh, people there and they went around documenting their own space uh, and sharing it on instagram and today it's a much larger movement called uh, voices of rural india which again they are doing uh, you know they are telling their own stories and their own voice in the way that they want to tell them um so you know so and and, and you know one guy one extraordinary um, young man called stanzin jigmet um some i mean i i hope uh, you can see his film sometime he you know he dropped out of school when he was in class 6 and he grew up in a small village in in ladakh and eventually his film on renewable energy was shown across the globe by the un last year so i think uh, that shift is also happening it's not just outsiders looking in it's also people who are part of the land people who are part of the community who are also telling their own stories so 
so you know so let's um, you know let's perhaps take this conversation forward uh, in the context of films in the context of responsible tourism uh, may i first uh, you know ask kevi um, about your work with uh, wonder nagaland and as well as as a conservationist and how you see sustainable tourism growing in the northeast um, mm. especially in the context of the pandemic now that uh, yeah. you know the, the variables have changed the the variables have changed quite a bit i would say um the you know india was heading towards being the largest tourism destination in the world by 2028 um it was you know by far the to uh, top 10 fastest growing destinations on the planet um and that's kind of where the motivation for wonder nagaland actually started um so when we were looking at some of the key issues that were being faced by um us in the northeast and in particular nagaland um uh, we came across you know the fact that um we do have the highest rate of unemployment of any state in india uh and that includes youth unemployment and so we were thinking about what to do about this um and um behold you have this booming industry uh in tourism you have you know 1.1 million visitors per month uh just in january last january and we thought this is an opportunity that we can definitely um capitalize on and so what we were looking was to create an opportunity for everyday nagas to generate a livelihood to share through sharing their natural and cultural heritage so every naga would have the opportunity for gainful employment um and that would be intertwined with what it meant to be a naga and this is quite a possibility already in india you have 1 in 10 people employed through tourism and travel and that was only growing um and so what we wanted to do was protect our natural and cultural heritage through sustainable uh tourism and also offer this up as a gift uh to our global village and so when we were discussing or having that conversation about what is this gift that we want to offer up um we looked back at what do we have and what do we value uh as nagas and we have this deep value of what is unique and local about each of our tribes and our kells and our villages you know overarching all of our diversity uh is the sovereign structure of our village state so each naga village is a sovereign state and we have maintained and respected this relationship with each other since time immemorial so what we came through in this conversation was a belief that our deep respect and connection to what is local and the experience of that acts as an antidote to a society drunk on globalization so an antidote set on an agenda erasing that which is indigenous so the conduct of being in this relationship which that which is indigenous is witnessed in many practices of sustainability so when you talk about from farm to table or sourcing local materials and resources protecting nature and wildlife and mostly it's about understanding one's impact on what's occurring at a particular place and mostly the particular place where you are so uh we nagas we identify ourselves with our ancestral village and strive to live by twin cultural values of social and environmental responsibility and respect for one another one another as human beings so what we wanted to do was share up these experiences to travelers and so that we may have an equitable exchange of values with the travelers that are coming through yeah. and we were when we were looking through how to achieve this um the thought came across about having a council of elders and so what we did was put together multi-day travel uh multi-day tours that had what we call an elder welcome so travelers on these tours were inducted into these values and the ways of the naga by a council of elders and so our elders were uniquely placed to invite people in because they'd live both inside of nagaland and outside whether it be uh, on mainland india or outside of the country and so these elders would uh, help frame up the travelers experience so that they could be attuned to these practices so that when they were traveling through nagaland that they would be attuned to these particular practices and these values that we're talking about and then they could really experience that so um for our sustainability was really about well wonder nagaland as an organization was really about a manifestation of sustainable practice through that um and then helping translate our traditional cultural 
narrative for visitors from around the world. Um, and so that's really initially how we set up at the start of last year. Uh, currently, we're in a state of hibernation uh, due to um, the, yeah, the current pandemic. Um, so we probably we really did target ourselves at international tourists. Um, and we saw that's where, uh, I guess, the greatest value that we could provide for our local population, for travelers as well. Um, but during this time, what we've been doing is really fine tuning um, the way that we, our narrative and the way that we express and what value that we're producing. So uh, leaning away from what is tangible and really talk about the intangible resources uh, that one can experience when they're in Naga. And so that it might be the cultural diversity, it might be the sense of community, or it might be even the, the, the change of the sense of time when you go into a rural area. And for those who grow up in rural areas, will understand just the way that time flows differently from being in a major city in Mumbai or Delhi, or being in a rural area in the Northeast or wherever you might be. Um, and so that's really where we are today. Right. Oh, wonderful. So, you know, uh, tell me something. Uh, I'm just going to quickly ask you one question that is directly connected to uh, what you've just told me. You know, uh, if I had a penny for, you know, for people asking me, um, isn't Bhutan the model to go for, you know, um, yep. high, high value, low impact tourism, isn't that it? So you just have yep. fewer people. And now with the COVID restrictions and people, you know, worrying about social distancing and so on, mm. even more so, I find, especially in the Northeast, at least there are three states in the Northeast, yep. the Northeast, I was talking to people at Airbnb as well, and they're also laughing about it, saying, you know, everybody wants it to be exclusive and, you know, <laughs> this access is limited and whatever. So yeah. travel is in some ways, travel used to be a privilege right travel was mm. traditionally a privilege it's yeah. only now that it has become more uh, accessible but do we need to go back to that you think um, will it exclude uh, too many people and you know isn't this experience meant for everybody or um, you know how how do you see um, yeah. how do you see that um, yep yeah, I think forward? yeah so yeah, historically, obviously, travel has been uh, a luxury uh, and a privilege for those. And more recently, we've seen uh, an explosion um, with uh, with the upcoming middle class. Um, you know, 88, I think they say 88% of the next 1 billion middle class will be in Southeast Asia, I will be in, yeah, in Asia. Um, and so with that, I am, I do still believe that travel is a privilege um, for uh, my region in particular and for areas like uh, my village in Konama, um, I do see less travel as being more uh, as, as being better, uh, less footprint. Um, we simply don't have the infrastructure uh, to deal with um, the, the numbers of people that want to come. Uh, and um, I went to a, a village uh, outside. So my mom is from Shillong. Mm -hmm. Um, and I went to a village um, just outside of Shillong uh, quite a few years ago, uh, and it was touted as the, the cleanest uh, oh, yeah. village in Megali. Yeah. And, and uh, while I was visiting there, it, it was quite beautiful. And, um, and over the years, droves of people have been going there. Um, and uh, yeah, and when, and, and when my cousins, you know, cause they're so close, they go there, it's just not the same experience. Um, and then time and time again, from my childhood um, to see uh, busloads of people coming in uh, and, and not being able to, uh, I guess, respect the values um, that we would hold traditionally is, is a bit of a heartbreak uh, for us to see uh, the change of that. So, Yes, it is a luxury, um, and yes, it is a privilege, um, and along with that comes uh, with with the cer certain level of respect that you do have for the area that you're visiting. And so, when we were talking about uh, having a council of elders and having that sort of induction um, in my village in Konama, we, we we call ourselves the Green Village, you know, um, uh, and I think there has to be some level of understanding of that, okay. and I think for that privilege, people do have to go through a certain level of uh, educating themselves on what it means to be responsible. Um, and that does uh, in turn, and it doesn't have to be exclusive in the sense of uh, creating financial barriers for people. 
Right. Um, that's not what I'm on about. I mean, but it does mean it does have to be exclusive in the sense that people are willing to practice being responsible while they're in those areas. Right. Right. No, that's, um, you know, that's brilliant that you've, you know, you added that because I think for a lot of people, they, they probably presume that you meant a financial barrier, yeah. but it was, you know, yeah, you know, because there are carrying capacities for every place. And as we know, mm. you know, if, if only we did it with a little bit more, in, a little bit more scientifically, I think we'd be, um, we'd be able to t bring in everybody, except we would do it in a more uh, organized way. So, Yep. You know, uh, Mona, um, to, to now move on to you and ask you perhaps because, you know, Panjgani is has always been popular. You know, it's it's I think it invented over tourism at a time when nobody knew what over tourism was. But you have been there for so many years and, you know, you you've again practiced sustainability. The, the beautiful place, the red, you know, Redstone has been around for much longer than any of these labels, any of these you know, uh, conversations. So can you tell us a little bit about your work and, um, you know, why you think, uh, you know, why did you do it? And you know, what into your mind is, is true tourism or the right kind of tourism going forward? Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for that question. Because um, it was no, uh, as far as tourism is concerned, um, it was right from my birth that my father decided to leave a city, uh, a business that he did, which was today listed in the stock exchange, um, Steel Age, and decided to leave Bombay and come and live here. And he established, there's a lake here, and he established a little business around the boating and a restaurant. So from my birth, I've been here. So, uh, and tourism was something like, I literally I was born into, you know, there were boats and restaurants and people coming and it was the hub of that of Mableshwar in those days very pretty and idyllic so I mean uh, you know it's not something the tourism aspect when, when I was 18 and I had to decide with my husband as to what we want to do together and what kind of a livelihood he put a choice to me and again I chose that we buy land and we stay on a farm rather than him go overseas and do a PhD uh, and be an academic. So it's just flowed from there. And the initial years, it was just fumbling and trying. We were young. I was very young and, uh, you know, trying to understand the land and make it more people friendly in the sense that we were on a ragged, rugged piece of land, which we finally started getting trees coming up and allow it protecting it. So it has kind of flowed. Now I'd like to just start, I, I've got these pictures, which I'd like to start sharing. We do this one? Yes. So um, that's our Redstone, our place is called Redstone, the Redstone Eco Center and Organic Farm. And so the concept of it being an eco center, um, you know, can we go? We just want to do that. Thank you. Uh, has evolved, and when we're talking about that, can we stop that? Pause it. Okay, um, so there is, so over these years, it's, it was in 1972 that we started, over these years, as our children grew up, we needed to school them, and we, we decided that the schools was not, the, the schools that we had here in Panchkani, and actually in many parts of, the, in, of India, were not, they were not conducive towards a sustainable life, uh, style. So we created our own homeschool. We, we ran eco camps where children from other schools came where they had an experience on the land. We, we went into organic farming so that we could grow our own food. And then the tourism is something that just came into the picture. So that's why we dared to call ourselves the Redstone Eco Center because it's kind of a center where a lot of this kind of activity is going on and where we're trying to reach out 
to our neighbors, if they're uh, chemical farmers to turn organic or to some of the other village people to look at how we can do tourism in a way where they are benefited quite, um, should I go this way? So that's our home. And that's a little picture with the poinsettias. And so this little collage has been, or this little bit of um, work has been done by one of the volunteers who were at Redstone. It says repair, restore and rehabilitate. And so we got to realize that over a period of time that you know, if we want to talk about responsible or eco-tourism or sustainable living for that matter, we need to see and we need to be actively working on rest restoration of, this, of, of these regions because we already have seen the degradation that is going on and, and no one else is going to come and do it. So here, I would like us to look at this whole issue in a very interrelated way. They're all connected, education and learning, livelihoods or tourism, everything is interconnected. It's not that we can look at all these issues in compartments. And so the kind of learning and education that we evolved in the little home school that we ran at Redstone, it incorporated all of this in it. And only from there we, can we today hope and expect that people within this population will be aware. And I'd like to give you an example of Rudranch Mathur, who was one of the key organizers or founders of this whole movie, this film festival. He was one of our students in, this, in the home school. So something we sold at that time is being reaped now. So and if, the point I'm trying to make is it's not going to be a standalone ecotourism. We have to work at all levels and we have to have patience. And it will. I feel it so strongly that it will one day flower as it already is into something very beautiful. So we need to have that sustaining power. Okay, here, <laughs> this is one of our lovable streams, the Lingmala waterfall stream, it's strewn with a whole lot of things we've spent. I have spent with others, lots of many, many years over going to the same stream and at the end, they, it'll all come back with pulling or cloth and plastic from the roots, which it gets entangled in the roots, but the cleaning goes on. Here we are. Okay, similarly, uh, of course, as Kushila and myself were talking just this morning when I happened to call her, is that this kind of issue of, of plastics and garbage and cleaning, it has to be looked at in a systemic manner. That and that is something that Kushila has recognized. I'm very happy to know that. She's also one of the people who was a youngster um, when we earlier years. Uh, and to know that she has that realization because we can't do away with the garbage and we can't do away with uh, waste and things like that by just trying to collect it. It has to be a deeper systemic approach which we have to take. I don't want to go into all those details, but why in, in what way is it related to a sustainable um, tourism is because it, it will not happen just as a sustainable tourism focus. It has to happen with us being active with our community, uh, without the tourists there, you know, just us, we have to do it and we have to think and get together and make our teams. Now, this is a picture of the tableland, the plateau, which is 
uh, it is a rocky outcrop. This ecosystem is called a rocky outcrop. And this is a picture taken at a time of the year when the species are dormant. It, look, it would look to many and even to some botanists and ecologists that this is a gone case. There's nothing that will come up here. But come the monsoons and it revives, you see? And it blooms and this year in COVID, it's just burst out and bloomed. So these are ephemeral species. And so we, this is how we can involve our guests and tourists by coming here. They go to a place like called Kas to see the, it's called the Valley of Flowers of Maharashtra. And we have had a certain kind of activity going on onto this place which has rendered it a bit like this picture. But it's given a chance, it will bloom like this. These are the rocky outcrops, if you can see the rocks. This is just behind our farm, which is a lesser known plateau and rocky outcrop. Now the question is, how do we safeguard this beautiful flora and fauna that is there, very minute uh, fauna that you find inside these rocky outcrops. They won't be huge animals, but there's a huge amount of biodiversity here. And how do we try to work around those whose livelihood is based on something that is kind of literally trampling on this? There are horsemen, there are horse carts, there are little shops selling things. Over the years, they have come up there. And there is a certain amount of disturbance to this region. How do we get together and see that the people who are doing this work are getting their livelihoods this way, can be diverted to be able to portray this beauty of, these, of this landscape, understand the species, take the people around knowing this rather than do something that is destructive. That's our challenge. And it can be very interesting. Panchkani is our hometown of schools and children can be involved. Their whole curriculum can be, the hub of learning can be around nature that we find around. I'm giving this as an example of this region, but something that can be used in many places. Uh, here they are, the beautiful flowers, and here are enthusiasts which come around who want to look at it all in a much more intense way. This is, uh, this is on the ro rocky outcrop. There's a very special kind of orchid that comes just for two weeks in the cracks. That's the way it is. It's beautiful. Uh, so then, we're going back now, we're rushing. This is, in, this is in Udaipur, the people. There is so much of diversity, cultural diversity. When there is biodiversity, it automatically follows that there'll be cultural diversity. So that's what we have in India. And that's the pride of India, that in every region, there's a different diversity of habitat and ecosystems and also cultures. This is our, this is a central area in our home. And it, this too has evolved just out of our interest and you know, my sense of aesthetics or what I like. So you see our floor is cow dung. We have a uk, um, jata and a ukal. This is where we hand pound rice and grind grain. So these are experiences we share with our guests. The walls have mud on their wall, the, uh, plastered with mud and cow dung. The floor is plastered. And a lot of the uh, fittings in the house, the doors, windows are used with recycled wood from old houses. I'd like to, 
Mona, we have we're running a little bit, uh, you know, okay. running out of time. So that perhaps you can take a minute or two to quickly okay. wrap up. Yes, yes. I will. I'll show you this one picture where there is a little bit of a burnt hole in this, in this, in this bench. There are cracks in the floor. There are buckets of for the leaks. But people are not bothered with that. In fact, the children participate in in mixing the grain. We take them for a farm tour and people get to know about how we can, uh, they can grow on terraces. This is on one of our terraces. This is uh, in you know, recycled containers. And uh, there's the history of strawberries, plucking and just, okay. So it, the, it's the tactile, it's the experiential. Uh, you know, you can just show them. And that's what I'm trying to say, that it's the it's the feeling of wonder that these three chairs and this brings story into it and a childhood fantasy into it. So yeah, that's it. I will stop. No, no, that was beautiful, Mona. I, 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 I lost track of time. It was not you. So thank you so much. Those photographs are, it's hard to take your eyes off them. I want to be where you are right now. I am in smoggy Delhi. So you have no idea, uh, you know, how distracted I was by your uh, beautiful presentation. Thank you. But uh, since we are, uh, you know, we are sort of running out of time, I wanted to um, quickly move on to, uh, you know, to, to have a conversation on, um, on how you know what kind of visual communication um, could perhaps help sustainable tourism grow in this country and not just as an educative tool um, also for documentation and in when we're talk talking about education as well uh, or communication with the end consumer or traveler as we call them how do we i mean do we do we show them the the junk i mean or will their eyes glaze over when they see another pile of plastic or do we completely show them what is beautiful and bold and you know gorgeous and what will draw their uh, you know um, draw them to that particular destination so uh, kushala um, if i can uh, draw you into the conversation of course uh, if you could quickly tell us a little bit about the challenge that you uh, plan to uh, you know run in uh, panchkani and why that you know why that sort of uh, you know ties in with this whole idea of uh, filmmaking and documenting and taking pride in what we have and uh, maybe you could also touch upon what you think uh, would be good for us i mean should we should we say give them the do's and don'ts or should we just focus on what is beautiful and experiential and leave it at that uh, thank you so much. Um, I think uh, in the conception of also Altef and the beginning of Altef, we were also thinking about what it is like, why we are based in Panchkani out of this really, really beautiful space. Uh, and we have a lot of tourists that come in. What, what's really happening here? And uh, so kind of looking at that closely. And when we are also coming from a perspective of creating imagery, we're coming from a perspective of also uh, showing what it is that we have. And I think one of the one one thing that I truly believe is that um, I, I think we, we were really looking into aspects where we can all start seeing more, where we can also start taking pride in the things that we see around us more. Uh, so one uh, one initiative we plan to do is uh, kind of what you also talking about, Sati, is um, uh, giving access. We all have cameras and phones now, and everyone in the villages, everyone Panjgani, everyone Mahabaleshwar uses their phones. Children use it all the time. School is happening on the phones. So being able to give access to uh, creating short films. Uh, giving like these workshops where uh, we speak about okay what is what does a story look like how do you create a story what is worth shooting uh, for instance like I went on a walk since there was a pandemic and we were all alone I went on a walk with uh, a cow grazer and I was just like oh tell me about this tree okay now tell me about that tree and he was like oh you know that is edible and that that, that plant is edible too and I was like oh really and I felt like I was a child again, looking at the whole landscape through a completely different vision. But I feel like in him telling me about the landscape, I think he looked at it intently more. He looked at it more deeper. And there was a kind of, um, there was a kind of um, 
what's the word for it? Um, uh, just pride in it, right? There was a, there was pride in it, and also that oh, this this matters. It's not just about what sells. It's also about uh, what we already have and what we are not really looking at. What is the possibilities of how to expand on uh, some of the things that haven't been given market value? Um, and I think as a result, we, we weren't necessarily able to, uh, to uh, conduct workshops or like even give opportunities as part of all tests this year due to the pandemic. But in the future, we hope so, hope to do so. But this year, we were able to uh, start uh, our Alter Sayadri Spirit Challenge, which is um, asking participants all over to that that have visited the Sayadris or live in the Sayadris to just take a photo and send take a photo of flora and fauna that they see around, and um, and kind of and and share it with us. Um, for in, and um, since I was also homeschooling this this summer because of the pandemic, um, I introduced some of the children to Google Lens. And the next day, because I, I also wanted to know what was around me, so I started taking like photos of what was around me and, and learning about it. The next day, like I they they brought their parents' phones. And they were like, look, Didi, we took photos of this. What is, look at this mushroom. Look at this like tree. Like, what is this? And suddenly it just, it was a matter of just exposure of this matters. And this, this really, we, we can, uh, and once we know that this is present, what can we do to protect it? Uh, and Marie, uh, if you could maybe share uh, some of the images that our participants are, uh, um, have, um, yes, have shared with us. Uh, I think this is a photograph of a wolf snake. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to <laughs> present it. No. There we go. Yes, this is a photograph of a wolf snake. You can, we can just uh, go, go past it quickly. Um, a, a really, really tiny frog in, in a house. Um, I think um, this, I think, is a cat snake. Um, I have no idea. So if someone does, please uh, message us. <laughs> um, a, a carcass of a dragonfly, yes. A grasshopper. I think these are like just super tiny moments that um, that I think that completely burst out. This is I, this is um, a crate, a common crate. Uh, this is a photograph uh, from uh, Kusuma uh, Santapuri. This is from Friday for Futures. Yeah, this was from Kusuma that was submitted. This is from Friday for Futures. This is from Nikhil Sheshta, which is a, a skilled wiper found near Kingar Dableland. Um, and then uh, this one is by Murumaya Mru Wildlife, the, the um, handle. Um, this one is another one uh, that, that I took in uh, on Tableland of uh, two uh, the, the, the famous Malabar squirrels playing with one another. Those yes. I have at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, now we can hear you, Kushala. Oh, oh, I said that that's about it and over to you again. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kushala. Those are, you know, those are beautiful, beautiful um, moments. And like you said, I mean, I love the way you put it that, uh, you know, it both the, you know, the person you went for a walk with and you, you had a very different experience simply because you were paying more attention to the little things. Um, and I think those are the those are the ones that you know that don't are not seen like you said they they the market value you know we haven't given them enough importance so far so before we quickly get on with the questions I just wanted to quickly run through uh, you know maybe like a a minute each uh, from all of you to understand uh, you know perhaps I mean uh, Kevi you told me earlier today when we were having a chat we were chatting in this morning that to you um, filmmaking or visual communication is about inspiration so how mm. do you see um, you know how do you see the visual medium uh, helping a sustainable tourism or you know yeah. uh, highlighting things that as Kushala puts it uh, should be valued more um, yeah. you know 
Yeah, it was really good to see the photos uh, from there, Kushal, and yours as well, Mona. I was uh, enthralled by the conversation. I could listen to you all day. Um, but yeah, in terms of film, the way that I do see it is as a, as a point of um, inspiration. And as Mona say, was saying that um, there is a requirement, not a requirement, there is uh, the, the requirement of experience. Like you have to experience these things to want to protect them. Um, while I was working in a conservation uh, project with um, uh, Bob Brown, he used to say this over and over again, is uh, to experience nature is to want to protect it. And for a lot of us, uh, nature is very far away. Um, and um, it is, <laughs> uh, especially for us in the city, sometimes it can seem like a distance. So the, the role of film and photography in the arts is really, for me, um, that, that, that first point uh, of inspiration and wonder. Um, and to really set up that narrative. Because um, we, we do play in different areas when we're talking about sustainability. So we play in the physical realm when uh, we talk about, uh, um, you know, growing new forests or we talk about recycling and we talk about the things that we do and we try to nudge people towards that. Um, and then we have the areas of legislation and regulation um, and the agenda setting. Uh, and we try to influence decision makers. Um, but the most powerful area and the area that um, us as an organization really want to influence um, is that framing the story. Um, and it's about setting up what is as cultural narratives that we tell. Um, because ultimately it's those cultural narratives that um, really influence our worldview uh, and what our values are. And those values are something that we will live and die by. And so when you're doing that, it, the, 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 the power of a film is immense. Because you can see the world through the view of the filmmaker or the protagonist. Um, and that, you know, that has just great influence to um, inspire somebody. And I was thinking about um, uh, the uh, Environmental Film Festival in Australia. Um, I go every year. And um, still, it, this was a couple of years ago, still today, um, they were doing a documentary about uh, the Okovenka Delta. Um, and it was called Into the Okavenka. And if anybody hasn't seen it, please do have a look. It's, it's a great documentary. But just following um, the, the team that was doing the expedition um, and they're, they're, them forming the relationship with each other um, and them forming the relationship with the land that they were exploring. Um, and I was able to be there with them. Um, and uh, seeing that film, um, you know, till now, it was a couple of years ago, uh, Okavenga Delta is still my number one place that I want to visit on this planet. Um, and that was just by being 11,000 kilometers away inside a theater in Melbourne uh, and watching this thing on a screen uh, just made me want to be there, experience it and, and be a part of that. So I think that, you know, film has that immense um, uh, possibility and especially during this time where uh, travel is restricted. Uh, and, and those experiences of, that we can't have around the world are reduced. Um, I see that film will have an even more important role to play uh, moving forward. That's fantastic. That's absolutely true. And I think, uh, you know, all the virtual tours this year, we thought they, yeah. you know, it, it, it couldn't get more, uh, you know, boring. But I know a lot of people who've been going on virtual tours. So, mm. you know, maybe there's, there's, you're absolutely right about that. So we've unfortunately run out of time. But, uh, you know, maybe it's a, maybe we could take a few questions. Marie, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we most certainly do have questions. One second. All right, so we have a few. Let me pick some of them. Mm, okay, this one. <laughs> Can tourism ever really have a truly positive impact since it, put, since it puts such a strain on resources and comes with a host of problems between people and places? Is sustainable tourism that has a positive impact a thing? Who would like to take that? Mona, would you like to answer yes. that? Yes, I, I can see your hand yes. going up. <laughs> I would. Well, I want to say that I definitely think that it's a boon from the point of view of education, awareness building, and for environment, at least the way I've experienced it. Because you tell your person who's coming to my homestay, we run these homestays, that you let them know beforehand 
that what the luxury they're going to have is definitely not ACs and other fancy kind of marble and all, but they, the luxury they're going to have is, is the forests and the trees and the green and the insight into sustainable living. And when they come, it's amazing. I get a lot of people from the IT sector coming in and they come in saying that they're stressed out. And when they come on a farm tour, when they see how we're making shampoo out of our, you know, soap nuts, shikakai, or I'm brewing my kombucha, which they can learn and try out and see the cow dung floors and even go to a washroom, which is not attached to their bedrooms, which they're all in India, I don't know about other countries, they're not used to. They go back giving you such good reviews and they're excited and they want to look at their life as how they can bring this into their lives or move away. So I think it's definitely a positive thing if we can only shift from the glitz and the, you know, all the glamour. Right. Mari, can I add to what she's just said? Just one line. So, you know, this is a this is this is a question I ask myself periodically. I wake up and say, really, can any tourism be sustainable ever? And the answer is no, to my mind. I mean, I know that you know the answer is no. Um, if I, you know, if I could, I would stop traveling. Except we as human beings have always traveled, and this is a reality that we must accept that we cannot stay in one place. We will want to go out, and we will want to do this. And it's not. Uh, and the only, the only, the best thing that we can do is ensure that it is low impact. Um, so, so it will still there will still be an impact, but it will be. We can try and at least restore, as you know, the word that uh, uh, Mona had used earlier: restore the landscapes. Do what we can to make it regenerative, uh, the tourism, but it will always have some sort of impact. So it, it is a reality. It's just how it is. Um, yeah. Besides the landscapes, we can restore attitudes. Yes. And mm. Absolutely. I think is very possible. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would have to object with you there, Shorty. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if we're saying can sustain uh, tr uh, tourism um, ever be sustainable, it's about can we as a society ever be sustainable? And if you think about that broad, because tourism and travel is only a subset, as Mona said, of our attitudes. Yeah. And so then I think then it's up to us to see, do we, do we have uh, faith and hope in, 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 our, in our society and humanity? And in saying that, I will say that our current paradigm is only some few hundred years old since the first industrial revolution. What is that? 230 years old. And, and, and before that, we've been living for eons in, in a different paradigm in a different way. Um, in, in my village in Konama, we'd been living the way that we had for over 900 years. Uh, and and the, the way that we're living now, we've got a little electricity, uh, we've got a, a little in internet connectivity, but th that's only been uh, less than a decade, maybe. Um, and so that I, 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 I would weigh up uh, kind of 900 years or in the in the uh, or for for India as a country you know thousands of years of attitudes and and values of protecting nature and being responsible versus the couple of hundred when we've just you know had a bit of a slip <laughs> yeah so looking at the the very very big picture I <laughs> I think that can be um, uh, a hopeful approach actually yeah i i definitely agree and there's another question that might also um be a great one for you to answer kevi is the commodification of culture a real problem or does tourism encourage the preservation of cultural practices um that that's a that's a that's a really tough one um and that's something um i think especially personally um you know i have to have that conversation with as well because um, on one hand, um, we are um, commodifying our culture because when we talk about Wanda Nagaland and we talk about our tourism experiences, we hardly ever talk about the tangible. Uh, we mostly talk about the intangible. And that, that's what I was saying, the sense of time, the cultural diversity, our shared history and all that sort of thing. Um, but we do try to um, uh, practice with ha that having as, 
as minimal impact um, as Shaudi was saying on, on the local community. And that's set up by using the existing social structures uh, to distribute wealth. Um, so for example, it's about setting up eco-village boards um, in Zileke, which is right next to my village. Um, it's about using those existing structures um, and then tapping into those narrative that overarch. So for example, for my village in Konama, uh, we have this thing called Feast of Merit. Uh, and actually, not a lot of Naga tribes have it. And the Feast of Merit is when a, a, a person or individual um, who is a, a, usually a business person accumulates a certain amount of wealth. They distribute it amongst their whole village and they host a giant feast. And then they become a poor person again. And they're given a shawl. And, and uh, the shawl is very uh, intricate and beautifully woven. And that shawl signifies that they have the highest honor in the village, but they are the poorest person in the village. And so I think that we can still uh, tap into these existing uh, social structures in the way that we have organized ourselves um, to promote the tourism and and also uh, when it comes to the commodification, commodification of it, um, be able to distribute that back into the community uh, and continue our those kind of responsible, socially responsible practices. Mm -hmm. um, just from a yeah personal viewpoint on that, because I've also lived in Melbourne and worked at Feast of Merit. Oh, wow. With Elliot. Yeah, which was then... Um, ah feeding its profits to a social enterprise yeah, who yeah, yeah. can work with social entrepreneurs in many, many countries around the world. And yeah, so it's, it's yeah. really interesting how that concept alone has traveled mm. and yeah, become a purpose to, to yeah. more organizations and missions that, yeah, it, it's really, really great to hear. Um, so uh, there's really that positive aspect of learning from one another as we travel, of course, there as well. And hopefully, yeah, we can keep minimizing the impact. Uh, Shoiti, I am definitely there with you. It's, uh, it's a lot about the how and the thoughts behind this, but it's a complex issue. Um, yeah, so, so if, may I just quickly, one quick example. So I, you know, there's this beautiful uh, small space like a homestay in Chhattisgarh. Um, and I remember speaking to the person who, you know, he's a friend now, we've, we've been in touch for about three years. Um, and it, it, you know, it's something as simple as you don't need to change what is, um, if you, if, if what is, is, and whoever's coming in to experience it will experience it anyway. So if somebody has to see a local dance or, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be performing at the hotel or the homestay, um, they should, you know, the dance is if the dance happens on a particular Tuesday or on during a certain festival or during a wedding, um, they catch it if they're lucky or if they're not, um, or, you know, they, they just don't make special concessions for the tourists because, uh, you know, that's when it becomes uh, commodified. That's when it becomes a product. Um, they will have, have fun no matter what. If they go to a place which is, which is beautifully and beautiful and culturally rich, they will find enough and more experiences to keep them engaged. And if you want them to come at a certain time, ask. I mean, if it's, if it's not disrupting anybody's life, um, you know, they, they will, they will also, sh they, if you are not disrupting their lives, they will also include you in their, in their functions, include you in their festivals. So you, that's a much richer experience than watching it, than the museumification, as you know, as somebody put it once, of culture, where you, you, you put it out on display for somebody else to come and see it within a short time. So anyway, that's what, so we don't need to change anything. We just need to, you know, invite people to come see it as is, that's it. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and sadly, we're coming to the end of this panel discussion as well. And I think Kushala also already dropped off, um, <laughs> probably not on purpose, but because of various internet connection issues. Um, but we're glad she was here for so long. And um, as she had mentioned that photo challenge is actually something she had been playing with for a long time. And we're happy that we could just do it through our social media channels, which have been building throughout the last year. And such, yeah, showing those sm small moments make such a difference. I really believe in that as well. And so to all of us um, here at Alt-F, so we also thank you for those moments and that you've taken to 
share your thoughts and your experiences and your hopes for the present and the future and your learnings from the past. Um, thank you so much to all three of you and Kushala, <laughs> who has already left the conversation for now. And we hope that we can one day all meet in, in Panchkini. Yes, hoping. Thank you. Thanks a Looking lot. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Take care. And for everyone else um, in the audience, we have a trash talk workshop with Bare Necessities coming up. So a little bit more learning coming your way. So see you all soon. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you all. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.